So how many of you have been enjoying just the, the incredible weather we've been having these last few days? It has been, been a real pleasure. In fact, I've had to remind the kids, or my wife has reminded the kids, that this is only fool's spring. We're still in February. We've got a few more days. And winter's coming back for a bit. But man, does it feel good to be outside and to feel the sunshine. And knowing you guys, I'm sure there's many of you that have started thinking about your gardens for this coming spring. What are you going to plant? What are you going to grow? Maybe you've even started to buy your seeds. Now, my grandfather, he planted tomatoes. That was one of the big things he planted. And my father also liked to garden, and he planted tomatoes. So when I became an adult and had a garden, what do you think I planted? Tomatoes, of course. I'm pretty decent at growing tomatoes. But a few years ago, my family decided to branch out and to try some other things. Potatoes, zucchini, carrots, pumpkins, and, of course, tomatoes. And would you know it, I wasn't overly successful. I'm so glad that you guys are avid gardeners and are very successful because I was blessed by the bounty of your gardens, even though mine didn't quite produce as much as I would have liked. So knowing that you are so skilled in gardening, I have some questions for you. And these aren't rhetorical questions, so shout out the answers. Does every seed that you plant grow? Oh, you too, eh? I was hoping it was just me. Does every plant that grows produce a great crop? No. No, it doesn't. Sometimes the plants look so beautiful, they're growing and you're excited, but they never yield anything. And just as every seed planted does not necessarily grow or produce a good harvest, not everyone who hears the good news takes it to heart and is truly changed by it. You see, listening to God's Word is not the same as truly receiving it with a heart of faith. And we're going to see that as we explore Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Frequently, this passage is called the parable of the sower, but perhaps a more accurate title would be the parable of the sowers, uh, sorry, the parable of the soils that the sower sowed in. It's a little tricky, though, so we'll stick with the parable of the sower. So thank you, George, for reading that parable for us. That was the first nine verses. We're going to go a little bit beyond that today because we want to get to Jesus' explanation of what that parable was all about. So we'll be looking at verses 1 through 20. But first we need to lay a little bit of groundwork. The what and why of parables. Now parables are, in essence, object lessons or stories taken from the natural world that teach a spiritual truth. I use object lessons almost weekly with the children downstairs. They love it because when we look at things we get to see in our day-to-day -day life and then transfer that application to the spiritual, sometimes things really click in our minds. In fact, I know you adults love object lessons too because you were a bit bummed when the object lesson time went just downstairs and you didn't get to see it every week either. Object lessons are so much fun. Now, as I said, they can also be stories. You know, we have the story here of the sower. You have the story of the tenants who are not faithful to their contract. You have the story of the Good Samaritan. And it's important to understand that when these stories were shared to communicate a spiritual truth, the claim wasn't that these stories were factual. You know, these are hypothetical stories, even if they are based on possibly a real incident. The important part is what truth are they communicating? And that's another characteristic of a parable it's important to keep in mind. A parable is generally designed to look at one truth and apply that spiritually. They're not allegorical. What I mean by that is if you read the story Pilgrim's Progress, 
That is an allegory. Almost everything in that book has a spiritual equivalent, right? In contrast, a parable normally is focusing in on one main thing it's trying to teach. Not everything has a spiritual counterpart, even though traditionally people have often treated them that way. And this is very important because it makes us think as we read these, what truth, what is the bullseye in the target that our Lord was trying to communicate when he taught parables? Now, with that general statement made, we do have to acknowledge the fact Jesus didn't stay in a box very well. So there are times where he will break those principles of one story, one truth. Sometimes there will be several spiritual truths sprinkled in. And, you know, you can't really turn to the master teacher and say, you're you're teaching wrong. That's not how you use parables. So we'll, of course, say the Lord knows what he's doing. But when we look at his parables, focus first and foremost on what is the primary truth being taught through this parable. So that's the what. That's what parables are. But why? Why? Why did Jesus teach through parables? Now, I mentioned earlier that parables and object lessons are a great means of of, uh, communicating a spiritual truth through a physical reality. Okay? Explaining something that we don't understand through something that we interact with every day. And so they can be ways to open people's eyes. Ironically, though, parables can also be a way of closing people's eyes. A method to openly share spiritual truth while straining out those who are spiritually unresponsive. For instance, if we go down to verse 11 of of Mark 4, we read, And he said to them, to you has been given the secrets or the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, and going on into verse 12, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And if we go to Matthew and his account of this same teaching, we get a little more explanation of why Jesus said that. So this is Matthew 13, verse 12. And to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, when we are responsible with the truth that God has given us, and we take it to heart, accepting it and applying it to our life, he then blesses us with more truth. He reveals more to us because we've been receptive to what he's taught us. However, when we ignore the simple, clear truth of the Scripture that we already have, can we expect him to give us more? No. In fact, the warning is, even the truth that we've already received we're going to become numb too. We see this all the time, sadly. There are so many clear truths that are communicated openly in the Scripture, and even Christians, even churches, have become really great at ignoring them to their own loss. And so as Jesus preached the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, he did so mostly through parables when he was with the crowds. And this taught clear spiritual truth, but it was a truth that went right past so many people. It was a way of straining out those who truly weren't listening. The amazing thing is that God's desire is to teach us, is to show us the truth even when we're pretty thick-headed. And we see that with the disciples. 
Verse 10 says, And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. They didn't get what this parable meant either. And in fact, it's very interesting that this is the very first parable Mark records in his gospel. Others are to follow, but this comes first. And Jesus says to them in verse 13, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? In other words, this parable, the first one that Mark records, is recorded for a reason. It becomes the key to help unlock future parables. And if the disciples don't get this one, the rest is going to be hopeless. You see, the key is are we truly listening? In fact, Jesus bookends his parable with that truth. Verse 3, the first word there, listen. And then he goes on and shares the parable. And then after he shares the parable, verse 9, and he said, he who has ears, let him hear. This parable is all about how do we actually hear, receive, accept, and apply the truth of God. And sadly, we're going to see that out of the four types of soil represented here, three of them produce spiritual crop failure. And so Jesus explains this parable to the disciples, even though they didn't get it. He says in verse 14, the sower sows the word. So there we have the first thing, that the seed which is planted is the word of God, God's truth. Now, who has it been in the book of Mark who's been going around sharing the word of God, proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God? If you go back to chapter 1, you find that it's Jesus. Jesus is the one bringing the truth of God. Jesus is the sower. As I told you, while most parables aren't allegorical, they only communicate one truth, this first parable breaks that mold. We see that the seed planted is the word of God. We recognize that Jesus is the one planting it. And just to make it a little more interesting, if you go to the chapter 1 of John, who is even the Word of God? And the Word was what? Made flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus, in many ways, is both sower and seed. He brings the truth of God. But we have a role to play. Verse 15, and these are the ones along the path where the seed, where the word was sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. What happens to soil when people walk on it? It gets hard. Even in your gardens that you carefully till up, as you walk between the rows of plants, what happens to that ground? It gets compressed. And over the season, it gets harder and harder and harder. Will a seed that is tossed onto that normally grow? No. It can't get in. And in the same way, when people have a hard heart, a heart that isn't open to the truth of God, isn't living in faith towards God, we shouldn't expect to see that seed take root. We see examples of these type of peoples in the book of Mark. In fact, we've already seen some. If you go back just one chapter to chapter 3, there we read about this, the religious elite who came up from Jerusalem and accused Jesus, the sower, the one bringing the word of God, that he was doing miracles by the power of Beelzebub. Their heart was hard. 
They did not have ears to listen and hear. And the scary thing is, when that is our heart, when that is our attitude towards God, we're warned that the evil one comes and steals away that truth. Remember what Jesus said from Matthew 13, that the one who has not, even what he has, will be taken away. When we refuse to accept, or people refuse to accept the truth of God, it doesn't even remain just sitting on the soil. The evil one snatches that away. They lose the opportunity. And this reflects the heart attitude of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And then we get to the second soil. Jesus says in verse 16, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And then in verse 17, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution, or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. What a sad reality. They've seen the truth. They've received it even. But that truth doesn't put down roots deep into their life because there's a blockage. There's rocks. The soil is insufficient to support the crop. It's easy to be afraid, isn't it? There's so much in our world that can cause fear. And for us as believers, when we accept the truth of God, that puts us on a collision course with the world around. Even here in Canada, where we don't face overt persecution, there can be harsh consequences if you live out your faith. If you're open about your faith in the workplace, you can become shunned. You might even lose your job. You know, if we live out God's truth on sexuality and men and women being made as men and women in His image, and we teach that to our kids, sometimes you can lose your kids in this country. But do we respond in fear or in faith? You know, Jesus was very clear with his disciples that if they followed him, they were to expect persecution. This is what Jesus says at the Last Supper in John 15, verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. So how do we deal with this? This reality that if we are faithful to the truth of God, we will face persecution of some type in our life. What do we do with that fear? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The reality is there's a lot we can fear in life. But the one who we should truly have our allegiance to, the one that we should be in awe of, in reverence of, and in fear of because he is supreme, not just in this life, but for eternity, is who? Our Lord God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the one who is eternal. He is the one who oversees our eternal destiny. He is the one who will bring us to eternal life. And if we fear him, if he has our complete allegiance, guess what? We don't have to be afraid of puny mortals. The worst they can do is take away our stuff or take away our life. And once they've done that, they can't touch us. Now, those are brave words. Those are bold words for someone who's never gone through that sort of persecution. 
And I won't know if I'm ready to stand that till the day comes. But what I can do to prepare my own life now, and I encourage you to, is have an appropriate fear of God. When we fear the one who is to be feared, we don't have to fear the one who is not. And you know what? That can happen even in small ways. Are we willing to be brave as we follow God in the day-to-day? Are we afraid of what our neighbor will think of us if we speak his truth? Are we afraid of what our boss will do if we speak the truth at work? We won't be ready for big persecution if we don't begin to practice the fear of the Lord even in the small areas of our life. So shallow soil, rocky soil, that's soil number two that produces spiritual crop failure. And then there's a third. Starting at verse 18 and then going into 19. But the others are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enters in and chokes out the word and makes it unfruitful. If there was ever one of these soils that the North American church was prone to, it's this one. As a culture, we are fat with excess. Most of us don't worry about whether we're going to be able to have food on the table. In fact, we have so much more than we need that our possessions often begin to own us. I truly believe that the American dream is a nightmare. Because we replace the greatest good, God and His truth, with lesser goods. Biblically, we call that idolatry. The first of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shall have no other gods before me. And it is so easy in the relative wealth and affluence of North America to let our stuff invade our life to such an extent that our relationship with God is strangled. And just like there are real things that we can fear when it comes to persecution, there are real worries in life. You all went through the last three years along with me. Things were rough. There was uncertainty. We wondered about our supply chain. We've seen increased cost of mortgages. Are we going to be able to afford our house anymore? We've seen inflation out of control. Real problems. But that doesn't have to dominate our life. In fact, if we will keep our focus on God and His truth and what He is doing, His promise to us is that we're actually freed from worry about those smaller, not unimportant, but smaller matters. This is one of those passages that has really gotten me through the last three years and challenged me to live out God's truth in my life through all the difficulties we've just gone through and will continue to go through. This is Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read verses, verse 25 and then jump down to verse 31 through 33. Jesus says there, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body. What you put on is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. And then skipping down to verse 31, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. 
And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom. Sorry, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. It's not that we don't need those things. But our time, our energy, our affections don't have to be set on them. If we put our heart where it belongs, if God is the one we love with everything, He'll take care of the the smaller issues. Just like when we're in a proper relationship with God, we're freed from fear. When we're in a proper relationship with God, we are also freed from being consumed by all the necessities of life, by the allure of riches, or all the other things that could become idols if we're not careful. So, so far we've seen three different ways that the attitude of our heart, the posture of our heart can cause spiritual crop failure. A hard heart, but she doesn't want to hear what God is saying. Rocky soil, we're we're afraid of what will others think. And then a distracted heart. A heart that's choked out by everything else in life, good and bad. How many of you have ever had the privilege of teaching your kids to play football? A few of you, maybe. No hands? Okay, I see, I see two hands. Whew. I guess I should have chosen baseball. Anyway, when you teach your kid to play football, the first thing you have to teach them is how to catch a ball, right? You take the ball, you throw it to them, but what happens if they don't actually want to play? If you drug them out of the house because you're, you, went, you need fresh air and exercise, and they stand there, you can't make me. You throw the ball and it just bounces off their chest. You could throw that ball all day long, but if they're not willing to catch it, are they playing football? Nope. Or maybe your family's like mine, and you're uh, almost getting enough kids to have a football team. And you get the kids out in the backyard, and you're trying to teach that youngest how to catch the, the ball, and they catch it, and they're all so excited. And then they realize that when they catch it, now they're in the game, and their bruiser of a sibling is coming to take them out. And they throw that ball away and run the other direction. Or, also like my family, if your kids are prone to uh, ADHD and there's so many things going on through their head, you could throw that ball at them. And their attention span is so short, and there's so many other things going on. The clouds, the flowers in the grass, the dog poop on their foot. That by the time the ball gets to them, they're not paying attention anymore. And once again, it just bounces off. And all of these things can happen in our life as Christians. We can be hard-hearted and not actually even receive the truth of God. We can be afraid of the people who are going to knock us out instead of trusting God and chuck that truth away from us and be like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of the Bible. Nope. Or we can simply be too full with good things and too worried about life to receive God's instruction for our life. Those are the three failures that Jesus mentions in this parable. And then there is one soil that is fertile soil, that receives the truth of God. And there are three things about that soil that make it successful in doing what it's supposed to do. This is verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Three things about that soil. It hears the Word of God. This is where it differs from the hard soil. When God's truth comes to us, 
Are we listening? Do we want to hear what he has to say to us? The second thing is that soil then accepts God's truth. It's willing to actually hold out its hands and catch the truth. Now, both the second and third soil did this to an extent. But then there's a third thing that separates this last type of soil from the rest. It bears fruit. God's truth is able to put down roots into our life and grow and flourish. And because of that, there are spiritual results in our life. How we listen, receive, and apply the Word of God in our life makes all the difference. Listening to God's Word is not the same as truly receiving it with a heart of faith. If we want to be people who are truly transformed and changed and walking in a relationship with God, we must not simply hear. We need to accept it, and we need to live it out. And how do we do this? How do we apply this truth in our own life? I think the first thing we have to do is be cautious. Don't assume that coming to church and hearing the Word of God preached is going to automatically make you a spiritually effective Christian. I grew up overseas as a missionary kid, moved back to the U.S. when I was 18. And I was shocked by the reality of cultural Christianity in the USA. I remember talking to a popular girl in my high school and mentioned that I was a Christian, and her response is, oh yeah, I'm a Christian too. I said, oh. I was truly surprised because her life didn't show that. And I said, so what does being a Christian mean to you? She's like, well, I go to church sometimes. My parents go to church. We have to understand that doesn't make you a genuine believer. Hearing the Word of God, coming to church, even going to a, a Bible study or a life group is not sufficient. And the danger is you can become inoculated to the Word of God. Remember, when we do not respond to the truth that God has given, we lose it. That's actually the group that scares me the most. You know, I am so glad for our children that are part of the church. I am so glad they have the privilege of hearing God's truth from a young age, that that is their first worldview. They believe in the God of the Bible. They believe that he created the world. And that, that's not all having to be changed later when they come to know God. But there's a danger in it too. There's a danger that they can grow up thinking that they're saved simply because they grew up in church. And they can become hard to God's truth. You know, one of my continual prayers for our youth is that their faith would truly become their own, that they wouldn't be trying to ride on the coattails of their parents, that they'd realize that they have to make a personal decision to trust Jesus as Savior and as Lord in their life. Coming to church won't save you. And the scary thing is there are people who come to church never having truly received it and applied it, and they think they're saved and they're in for a rude awakening. And that scares the living daylights out of me. And it should you. And we should be in prayer for these individuals, praying that God would wake them up. That God would take them from being simple hearers and break up that hard soil in their life. They need a plow. So that truth can penetrate into their lives. Thankfully, God is good. He does that at times. You know all those very bad situations that we go through? And when we go, oh, I need God. That's him breaking up hard soil. 
My prayer is that for our own church family, for the kids, for the teens that are part of our church, for the guests who are visiting, that they don't have to get to plow time before God's truth penetrates into their life. And for you, don't be deceived. Don't think just sitting in those pews has made you good soil. Instead, I want you to be people who examine your life to see if there are signs of your life being fertile spiritual soil. Is there evidence of God's work in your life? Is He changing you? Are you being transformed? Are you living out His truth? You see, if we truly hear, accept, and accept God's Word, we will apply it. Jesus said very clearly in John 15, verse 5, I'll give Joel a second to find it because I'm out of order on my uh, passages here. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If we are walking in a relationship with God, if we are rooted in him, if his truth is rooted in us and gone down deep, there's going to be results. We will be people who will begin to live out the fruit of the Spirit. We will be people expressing love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. It will be just like breathing to us. You don't think about whether you breathe a plant doesn't think about whether it bears fruit. The roots go down and the fruit is, is produced. As we abide in Him, as we accept and receive His truth, we begin to live it out. You cannot believe something and not do it. And that's what James, the brother of Jesus, means when he says in James 1, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And so we need to realize that being in the church, hearing the word of God doesn't make us good soil. Instead, we need to examine our life. Ask God to show us what He is doing, what fruit He is producing in our life. And you know, that's a great encouragement. To look back over your life and see what God has done. How you're not the same person today that you were two, three years ago, ten years ago. You know, none of us have arrived. There are times that I look in the mirror spiritually and I go... Lord, I'm glad you love me because I'm spiritually ugly. i got a lot of work to be done. And yet, he has done incredible things. As we look back, we see how far we've come. We see the work of his spirit in our life. And this puts our, our heart at ease. Now, if you don't see these good signs then you need to look to see if there are signs of the other soils. Are there fears of yours that are keeping you from following God wholeheartedly? Are you even listening to God's truth? Or have you closed your ears? And then are there things in your life that are grabbing your attention and your focus is on there so much that you hardly have time for God. You know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are you treasuring? What gets you up in the morning? What can you not wait to see or do? I'll be honest, it's not always God for me. Which then makes me go, okay, Lord, I've got a lot of work in this area yet. Please help me. Please continue to be at work in my life. Because there's, there's so many good things we've been given. But the trick is, are our hands like this or like that? 
When our hands are like this, the things we have, we have to have. God, don't take those from me. When our hands are like this, we realize, like Job said, that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and we have a heart that is able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. This needs to be our posture when it comes to stuff. Now, most all of us will have some of these negative signs of infertile soil in our life. Don't despair when you see that. You know what? The disciples had those signs in their life too. There were many times where Jesus would teach them something and it just bounced off them to such an extent that there are passages that talk about their hearts were hard and Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. But guess what? He was still able to work with them and use them and transform them. And you know that phrase where Jesus says, and they will fall away, talking about the rocky soil? That's that same phrase that he used when he was talking to his disciples, warning them at the Last Supper that when he was arrested, they would fall away, and they did. And God was able to step in and restore them and deal with the issues in their life. And their lives became fertile soil to what God was doing. Eleven out of the twelve were successful. And they produced a crop of 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And in many ways, we're here because of God's work in their life. And so God was able to use flawed people like the disciples who had some of these problems. And guess what? He can use us if we are willing to come to him and say, Lord, I'm not perfect. I'm a mess, and I recognize that. I see this issue. I submit to your work in my life. Be the farmer who pulls the rocks who uproots the weeds. I want your truth to take root in my life and produce a good harvest. Let's pray. God, I am amazed that you are willing to entrust us with your truth that you reveal your truth to us through your word. I'm amazed at the blessing we have as, as your children living in this time that we have been given your good news. Father, we confess that we're not always very receptive to that. We don't always see it as good news. Lord, we invite you to be at work in our lives. We ask that you would examine us, and where there is fruit, you would encourage us. And where there is rocks and weeds and hard soil, Lord, might you be rectifying those deficiencies. We ask that you would bring us to a place where we would be responsive to you, that we would have hearts filled with faith that would receive your truth and apply it. And may you produce in us a harvest of 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold for your glory and for your namesake. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.